Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine the Possible, the podcast with a social justice perspective, a view from inside a nation resisting imperialist invasion, a voice in search of solidarity. The topic of this episode is the infrastructural imperialism of the Russian Federation. We will examine Russia's efforts to gain control over Ukraine's infrastructure, primarily focusing on the material infrastructure of digital communications, the internet, mobile cellular networks and broadcasting. I'll start by providing a broader perspective and defining the concept of infrastructural imperialism. Infrastructural imperialism is a form of expansion where one country or group of countries seeks to control the transport, energy and communication networks of other countries or regions. This can occur through economic pressure, political influence or military force. I will provide a few historical examples. The construction of railways and canals by the British Empire in India, Africa and Asia in the 19th and 20th centuries. This allowed Britain to transport its goods and troops and exploit the natural resources of its colonies. The establishment of transatlantic telegraph communication between the United States and Europe in the late 19th century. This strengthened American presence and interests in Europe and facilitated the spread of American culture and ideas. In the past decade, China, challenging the role of the United States as a global hegemon, has actively invested in infrastructure projects in various African countries. For example, China has financed and built railways, ports and power stations in countries like Kenya, Ethiopia and Tanzania. While the history of colonial invasions by Western countries is widely known and actively studied, the colonial settler character of the Russian Empire is strangely less obvious to many observers. It's astonishing that at the very moment when Russia is russifying the occupied territories of Ukraine, illegally exporting grains, sunflower seeds and art collections from there, its official representatives don't hesitate to speculate on the anti-colonial heritage of the 20th century. Russian authorities deny the colonial past of Russia itself. However, throughout its history, as it annexed new lands, Russia physically exterminated and russified peoples and exploited natural resources. Russia seized colonies not in overseas territories, but in the adjacent lands. For centuries, a significant part of the territorial expansion of the Russian Empire was Siberia, rich lands in northern Asia abundant in natural resources. The peoples and tribes of Siberia were subjugated by Russia through various methods, the most significant of which was the use of military force. Indigenous populations that refused to submit were annihilated. Some historians compare the scale of losses among the indigenous population to what happened in North America. Among other examples cited by historians is the Caucasian War in the 19th century. Its goal was to subdue the North Caucasus, inhabited by independent mountain peoples. The result of the conquest of the Caucasus was the physical destruction and forced expulsion of representatives of mountain peoples, such as the tragic fate of hundreds of thousands of Circassians from their lands. Historians have no doubts about the colonial nature of the rule in Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Russia began annexing Kazakh lands even before formally becoming an empire. But the conquest of the region was completed only in the 1890s. Competing for influence with the British Empire, Russia, from the mid-19th century, seized the entire western Turkestan, as the region was called then, up to the border with Afghanistan, India and China. It subjugated local Khanates, sometimes annihilating thousands of indigenous peoples. One example of an infrastructural imperial project is the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway by the Russian Empire in the 19th century. The Trans-Siberian Main Line passed through Siberia, connecting Russia with the Pacific Ocean. The construction took more than a decade and cost the lives of over 20,000 workers. The Trans-Siberian Railway is a tale of how the Russian Empire used infrastructure to expand its influence and control over new territories. The construction of this railway was not merely an economic endeavor, but also a political project. Its aims were to expand the empire and strengthen its position in Asia. 
This railway allowed Russia to swiftly move troops and goods to eastern Siberia and the Far East. Infrastructural imperialism is a significant part of modern Russia's foreign policy strategy. Its methods involve a close intertwining of economic and military tools. This can be seen in the case of fossil fuels. Russia's economy heavily relies on the extraction, processing and export of oil, gas and coal. Oil exports alone account for 45% of total export revenues, constituting about a third of the Russian federal budget. Before the invasion, Russia was the largest producer of natural gas, and the Russian monopoly Gazprom held a dominant position in the European market. Take for instance the Russian gas pipelines Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Before the war, someone might have viewed them as purely economic projects. However, Russia's invasion of Ukraine clearly indicated that these projects cannot be separated from Russian military calculations. The completion of Nord Stream 2 designed to export natural gas to Europe directly preceded the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. To ensure this is not just a coincidence in timing, it's worth noting that, since Soviet times, a crucial route for natural gas exports runs through Ukrainian territory. For 30 years after the USSR's dissolution, Russia employed methods of blackmail and pressure attempting to gain control over the Ukrainian gas transit system. In the Ukrainian media of the early 2000s, this confrontation was dubbed the Gas Wars. Even back then, the Russian Federation employed tactics of pressure and blackmail, such as shutting off gas pipelines and halting supplies during cold winter periods when temperatures in Ukraine often drop below zero degrees Celsius. The threads of the Nord Stream pipelines were supposed to be an alternative route for delivering natural gas. This freed Russia's hands, allowing them to exclude Ukraine from the supply chain and minimize the costs of military occupation. Russia used gas blackmail to exert political pressure on European governments post full-scale invasion. The goal was to force them to withdraw support for Ukraine, particularly in terms of arms supplies crucial for defense. An example of open infrastructural imperialism is Russia's ambition to seize Ukrainian ports on the Black Sea, such as Kherson, Mykolaiv, Odessa and others. These ports and their loading infrastructure are strategically vital for trade and the security of the Black Sea region. This would enable Russia to control maritime routes and restrict other countries' access to the Black Sea. The naval blockade of Ukrainian seaports which used to handle the lion's share of Ukraine's exports and imports before the war, combined with the abandonment of the grain deal in the summer of 2023, along with systematic shelling of Ukrainian port infrastructure is also part of these Russian strategies. Now Ukraine has to seek alternative routes, something Russia is actively preventing. By capturing the Zaporizhia nuclear power station, Europe's largest nuclear plant, Russia not only deprived Ukraine of a crucial source of electricity, but also used nuclear blackmail to pressure countries in the region. The destruction of the Kakovka hydroelectric power station dam by the Russian army wasn't just a blow to Ukraine's energy sector. It inflicted enormous damage on the irrigated agriculture of the arid southern regions of Ukraine. These areas lost their water source for crop irrigation for years not to mention the colossal environmental cost of this planned catastrophe. You can learn more about this in the previous episode of the podcast. Russia uses its military presence in Ukraine to gain control over key infrastructure assets such as power plants, railways, ports, airfields, oil storage facilities and communication lines. This clearly shows the intertwining of economic and military methods in what manifests as Russian infrastructural imperialism. Let's now delve into the situation concerning digital infrastructure. I'll start with the fact that Russia used the internet and digital communications to amplify its influence in Ukraine long before the full-scale invasion in 2022. The widely known bot farms on online platforms had long been part of the arsenal of Russian authorities. Even before the scandal involving Russia's interference in the 2016 US presidential elections, 
Ukraine was a target of these manipulative technologies. Perhaps you remember President Yanukovych, who epitomized open corruption and nepotism. During his rule, he made his eldest son a new oligarch, amassing a billion dollar fortune. Interestingly, the infamous American political strategist Manafort, who later led Trump's campaign, was working for Yanukovych back then. Under pressure from Russian authorities, Yanukovych made a sudden U-turn, abandoning the course towards economic integration with the European Union. Russian spin doctors, or political technologists, as they were called in the post-Soviet space, along with Manafort, assisted Yanukovych in combating the opposition, including through disinformation campaigns online and in the media. Due to massive opposition protests, Yanukovych fled to Russia. In 2014, seizing the instability in Ukraine, Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula and supported separatists in eastern Ukraine. These acts of war and territorial capture in physical space were accompanied by incursions and attacks in the digital realm, in cyberspace. From 2014 to 2023, in all Ukrainian territories that were temporarily occupied, Russia gradually blocked access to Ukrainian and international media, social networks, and other resources. It also spread its propaganda and disinformation among the local population. Here, it's worth examining how the mapping of cyberspace, a kind of digital geography, allows for a clearer understanding of the geopolitical perspective. In other words, by studying how Russia alters the digital geography of the Internet in its favor, we can better grasp what's happening on the ground and the aggressor's future plans. Changing the routing of computer networks on a regional scale, as it turns out, is not a swift process. Before 2014, when Russia occupied Crimea, all internet traffic from the peninsula went through mainland Ukraine. It took Russia several years to completely disconnect Crimea from Ukrainian internet. After the peninsula was seized by Russian forces, Ukrainian telecommunication companies were forced to leave the region, some voluntarily and others forcibly. However, Crimea was not immediately disconnected from Ukrainian internet. It took up to three years to achieve this. The Kerch Strait Bridge is widely known, a landmark infrastructure project of Russian neo-imperialism. Constructed after the annexation of the peninsula, it plays a crucial role in Russia's war against Ukraine. Military equipment, ammunition and personnel are transported over this bridge. Russia's digital infrastructure logistics efforts are not widely known. State telecommunications company Rostelecom laid an underwater communication line running a cable along the bottom of the Kerch Strait from Crimea to Russia. On site, services were provided by a newly established agent of Rostelecom, an internet service provider called Miranda Media. Remember this name, as it will come up again in this story. The overall logic of events was that during the occupation, Crimea gradually centralized its internet routing and moved as much data as possible through Russia. Similar processes occurred in the separatist entities in Donbas, which de facto fell under Russian control since 2014. Over time, direct internet communication between them and Ukraine was severed. Taking control of these Ukrainian territories in physical space, Russia also cut off internet connections. This is an example of how internet routes, infrastructure and network topology align with geopolitics. In other words, this is how imperialism operates at the network level. But our story doesn't end here. There were other aspects related to malicious attacks on digital infrastructure. In 2015 to 2016, Ukrainian banks, government institutions, transportation companies, train stations, and energy infrastructure faced destructive cyber attacks and were infected with malware. Millions of Ukrainians felt the consequences. Thousands of stores couldn't process transactions, making it impossible to pay for purchases. In one region, over 200,000 people were left without electricity for several hours. These attacks were orchestrated by hacker groups linked to Russian intelligence agencies. The 2022 invasion marked a significant escalation. The level of destruction caused by Russia grew exponentially. Now the physical internet infrastructure in Ukraine has become a target, 
facing attacks, seizures, dismantling and destruction. Mobile network operators and internet service providers were among the top priorities for capture. At the start of the invasion, Russian forces were unable to immediately cut off the majority of the country from the internet. There were several reasons for this. A notable aspect of Ukraine's internet development was the limited government intervention in its growth for an extended period. The network infrastructure was largely decentralized. Thousands of small ISPs operated in the country. Some of them were so small that they didn't extend beyond their localities or even specific districts within cities. This setup led to the existence of a large number of traffic exchange points between local ISPs and backbone providers. Such a network configuration resulted in an excessive resilience for Ukrainian network infrastructure. Disrupting connectivity to a significant extent was not that easy. However, attempts were made. In the initial hours of the invasion, hacker groups linked to Russia disabled tens of thousands of satellite internet modems in Ukraine and across Europe. These modems provided internet access to thousands of Ukrainians. It was a significant blow. A few days later, Russia launched targeted missile strikes on television towers. The aim was to halt Ukrainian television broadcasts. In the first weeks of the invasion, Russian forces managed to seize substantial territories in the southern regions of the country. Digital infrastructure and communications in these areas also fell into their hands. Russia immediately took action. The goal was to cut off the occupied territories in the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions from the rest of Ukraine, much like what was done earlier in Crimea. The first disruptions in the telecommunications infrastructure occurred when Russian armed forces had just started their movement. Within the initial weeks of the war, hundreds of base stations of each mobile operator were damaged. Shot antennas, cabinets with equipment blown up by grenades, and severed optical cables were common. Base stations didn't function because hundreds of towns and villages were left without electricity. Transformer substations were shot at by tanks and destroyed by rockets. Consequently, mobile network companies faced comprehensive problems with their networks. Russian military also jammed the radio signals of the Ukrainian mobile network while moving their military equipment and soldiers. They did this to prevent rapid exchange of data about the movements of Russian army units. Due to the ongoing hostilities and the shelling, major traffic transmission channels sustained damage. When some communication channels were disrupted, traffic was rerouted through the remaining ones. However, the redundancy of networks, which I mentioned earlier, is not infinite. During active combat, repairing damaged lines was impossible. As a result, users in areas occupied by Russian forces received internet with extremely low connection speeds. A significant phenomenon was the looting of equipment by Russian military personnel from the offices of Ukrainian internet providers. A striking example of this is the city of Kherson, a regional center in the south of the country. It was occupied by Russian forces for six months before being liberated by the Ukrainian army. Immediately after occupying Kherson on March 3, 2022, Russian military seized the city's television tower and broadcasted Russian channels. The occupation administration produced a special news segment called Kherson 24, where the occupation was referred to as liberation. Initially, Ukrainian channels were still operating in Kherson, but with messages distorted by dubbing them in Russian. Soon, radios were jammed, followed by internet and mobile network shutdowns. After laying fiber optic cable from Crimea to the city, local internet providers were forced to switch to Russian infrastructure. This rerouting of web traffic allowed for digital censorship and mass surveillance. Russia could monitor web traffic and digital communications, spread propaganda, and control what news reached the people. It's notable that the occupied territory had stricter censorship than in Russia itself. Residents of the Kherson region lost access to Ukrainian news media, as well as social media platforms like Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Google, Viber Messenger, and other resources. Russia also controlled mobile communication in Kherson and launched a local mobile operator using Russian country code PLUS7. The technical aspect of this process was facilitated by the Russian telecommunications company Miranda Media, an agent of Russian Rostelecom. 
privacy and user security were compromised, especially since any visible disagreement with the occupier's policies led to repression. People were arbitrarily detained, tortured and killed. Merely having pro-Ukrainian views was enough for the occupiers. As events unfolded, the Russian army employed scorched-earth tactics concerning infrastructure. Before retreating from Kherson in the fall of 2022, Russian forces mined and blew up the television tower, broadcasting center and distribution nodes of the city's power supplier. Russian soldiers mined roads, severed power lines and dismantled mobile communication towers, leaving the city without communication, heating, water and electricity. All these horrors of war might sound abstract to people who haven't experienced them firsthand. Thanks to the accounts of those who lived through six months of Russian occupation, we have a glimpse into the everyday life of an ordinary citizen in a city occupied by invading forces. Imagine living in Kherson, a fairly large city in the south of the country. Its pre-war population was over 300,000 people. On February 24, 2022, Russia initiated the invasion. Four days later, the occupying army entered Kherson. Small self-defense squads, formed from local volunteers, offered resistance. However, the forces were unequal. The self-defense unit was destroyed, literally shot down with heavy machine guns on an alley in the city center. Initially, Kherson residents staged protests against the war and occupation. To suppress the resistance, Russia deployed forces from the National Guard, a unit that had been suppressing protests in Russia itself for years. The Russian National Guard used force against Ukrainian protesters, identified the most active participants, and arrested them during raids at their homes. Many city residents disappeared without a trace and were subjected to torture and intimidation. Transportation links with other cities ceased to operate. Neither railways nor buses were running anymore. All entrances and exits to the city were controlled by occupation forces. Even if you owned a car, leaving the city was incredibly challenging. You had to pass numerous checkpoints where vehicles and people were meticulously and repeatedly checked. Bank branches weren't functioning either. ATMs were empty on the very first day when residents panicked and rushed to withdraw cash. Ukrainian television disappeared from broadcast a few days later. Internet and mobile connectivity initially function, allowing people to keep up with the news and communicate with family and friends in other cities. However, the connection speed decreases and communication outages become more frequent. Additionally, the occupying authorities block Ukrainian websites. To access them, residents must use VPNs. About a month into the occupation, a day comes when cellular mobile networks from Ukrainian operators and internet connections through ISP's cables completely stop working. The only access to information is through Russian television channels. In certain areas of the city, residents can catch signals from Ukrainian mobile operators. In these spots, locals gather, attempting to reach their relatives in other parts of the country. When the internet is restored, it turns out to be Russian, not Ukrainian, as the connection goes through cables via Crimea. Russian legislation concerning the internet and communication is significantly stricter than in Ukraine. The Russian Roskomnadzor, the state censorship agency, has the authority to block any websites deemed unfavorable to the government. Personal communications are also at risk. Russian intelligence agencies monitor and filter the internet at various levels. Anyone can become a victim of online surveillance. Using home internet to read global and Ukrainian media or to connect with the rest of Ukraine is now unsafe. Your home address is known to the local ISP. One can buy a SIM card for a mobile phone and use mobile internet from a Russian provider. To do so, you are required to provide personal details, including a copy of your passport and home address, to the seller. This is a requirement absent in Ukraine, where you can buy a SIM card at any supermarket without presenting any ID documents. Finally, after six months of occupation, under pressure from the armed forces of Ukraine, the Russian army was forced to retreat from Kherson. As a final blow, the Russians attempted to inflict maximum damage to the city's digital infrastructure. They mined and blew up power lines and mobile towers. To grasp the scale of these destructions, 
In November 2022, immediately after the occupation, there were only four functioning mobile base stations from the Ukrainian mobile operator Kyivstar in Kherson. Before the Russian invasion and occupation, there were 88 such base stations. Even these four stations were powered by generators as centralized electricity supply was disrupted. Hundreds of people gathered in the central square of the city every day because one of the operational base stations was located there. Undermining energy infrastructure. In the fall of 2022, Russia launched a massive campaign to destroy Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Hundreds of cruise missiles and kamikaze drones were directed at thermal power stations, electric substations, transformers, and high-voltage power lines. Ukraine's unified energy system experienced multiple blackouts. As a result of the bombardments, millions of Ukrainians were forced to go without electricity for days and weeks. People's homes were left without heating, water, and electricity. Communications also suffered greatly. Cellular towers remained without power for days. Many of these towers were equipped with batteries, but their lifespan lasted only a few hours at most. When electricity was cut off, ISPs were also unable to provide internet to consumers. To solve this issue, operators resorted to using generators. Ordinary users had to adapt as well. In urban areas where power cuts became a daily occurrence, fixed-line internet disappeared due to lack of electricity for modems and home equipment. Mobile internet could work for a few hours until the batteries at the cellular towers ran out. However, the connection speed in such situations was low due to the high load on the cellular base stations. According to the NetBlocks service, which tracks internet shutdowns worldwide, significant internet outages in Ukraine occurred almost after every massive missile attack during the fall and winter of 2022. Partially solving the problem were satellite internet terminals from Starlink. Mobile operators used them instead of damaged transport networks, providing connectivity to subscribers. One Starlink station with a download speed of up to 200 megabits per second covered several hundred people. However, there were inconveniences here as well. In areas without power supply, it was necessary to install a generator near Starlink and periodically refuel it to keep it running. As a temporary solution, Starlink proved useful during the restoration of mobile communication. There are grounds to believe that similar massive bombings of energy infrastructure will recur this winter. Russia is increasing its drone kamikaze attacks, launching 30, 40 strike drones over Ukraine every night. The Ukrainian military warns that there will be massive missile strikes. This means that digital communications, including mobile cellular networks and the internet, may suffer once again. Now, a bit of theory. Researcher Rita Zajatz, in her 2019 book on the history of global communications, introduces the term network control. Zajatz defines it as the ability to make decisions about territory, capital and technologies, through which one party ensures an uninterrupted flow of information while denying this to its opponent. Zajac divides network control into tactical and structural levels. Using Zajac's approach, the military occupation of Ukrainian territories provided Russian forces with network control over the communication infrastructure of the occupied regions at the tactical level. As for the structural level, which according to Zajats, refers to influence in the form of policies and control over narratives accompanying communication projects. Russia actively fights for influence in international institutions regulating global communications. Let's consider one example of this struggle. A year after the start of the full-scale invasion, the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, based in Geneva and an agency of the UN, prepared a report on the consequences of the war for Ukraine's telecommunications infrastructure. The report listed numerous destructive actions by Russian forces and described in detail cyber attacks carried out by Russia against Ukraine's IT systems over a six-month period. This was an important and valuable document. However, its publication went almost unnoticed. 
The report was released much later than expected and without any publicity. Reuters agency discovered the document after a considerable amount of time had passed. This means that the news about it was significantly delayed. Industry experts questioned whether the International Telecommunication Union didn't want anyone to know about the existence of the report. In its article, Reuters noted that the report was published in a so-called quiet corner of the organization's website, but did not provide a link. The only way to find the report was to directly contact the International Telecommunication Union and ask where it was located. Thus, the apparent reluctance of the ITU to draw public attention to its report might be an indirect manifestation of the structural level of network control promoted by Russia in global institutions. Russian revanchist imperialism focuses not only on territorial expansion and regional control. The so-called network control, at tactical and strategic levels, presupposes both the seizure of Ukraine's digital space and the creation of suitable narratives to justify and cover Russia's colonial interests. Let's not forget that all of this is part of the criminal war that Russia is waging against a sovereign nation. This podcast is based on reliable sources that are listed in the description. You can also access the materials by following the links provided.